Next speaker is John Pye. He's been <laughs> John, John's been a friend of mine for many years. Uh, when I first was at Dalhousie as an undergrad student, uh, my first job here was in the biological oceanography lab just down the hall, and <clears throat> I was my job was filtering seawater, and John was the the data manager for Dr. John Cullen and. Uh, John and I crossed paths many times over the years uh, as, as colleagues and friends and uh, now as the director of data with Ocean Tracking Network. Uh, John has, is instrumental in <coughs> ensuring that the, the functionality of Ocean Tracking Network uh, works for the users. So ensuring that people are uh, submitting their data, uh, providing protocols for cleaning the data and managing the data. Uh, permitting access to the data for everybody to do all the work that we do. Uh, John really has a, uh, an extremely important and influential role uh, in, in the lives of everybody at Ocean Tracking Network, and we're simply thrilled that he will be giving a presentation for our workshop today. So thank you so much for, for doing this for us, John. I really appreciate it. No problem. Just also in my secondary role is looking after the live streamers today. Sorry, I'll take about the 30 minutes break from that. So you guys are on your own in the chat room just for a minute. So um, I'm thrilled to bits that uh, Rob would be in a position to even think of me as someone who can come and give a talk to you guys as you're, as you're just sort of uh, getting into doing this kind of thing for a living. I think it's an amazing thing you all do and will be doing and I'm thrilled to provide some support uh, from the experience base that I've been able to build up over the years. So I'm here to tell you about the benefits of sharing your data with your colleagues uh, and with the world and how the OTN Data Center exists to help you do either or both of those things. So when you're looking to share your data or when you're trying to use your partner's data to supplement your own, the key is to make sure that everyone is recording that metadata and data to a uniform standard that everyone can expect and rely on. Um, the more that you record about all the different aspects of your field studies, your field work, the more applications that you'll end up having for those results. Uh, for the last decade and more, uh, researchers at OTN have helped us refine and revise our data collection techniques to arrive at something that is maximally useful while still manageable for people doing field work. Uh, this work is ongoing and live. Uh, we're always receptive to more ideas on how to make things easier on people in the field or how to make sure we're helping you collect and record the data that you need uh, from your partners. So by having this well understood, both by humans and by computers, uh, set of fields for recording metadata all about your field work, you'll find it easier to collaborate. And telemetry research, you do derive so much benefit from sharing data with your neighbors and with the world. So not just sharing the data itself, but also being able to uh, share and quickly implement techniques that others have built for analysis uh, that are dependent on the same input metadata and data. You'll find it easier to move uh, alongside your colleagues as you look to analyze and summarize this data. All right, so under the framework of OTN CFI funding, we're meant to provide infrastructure support, and this is the classic infrastructure support diagram that I like, because uh, we do get this done in a few ways. You saw this on Naomi's talk, but we maintain this set of core acoustic telemetry receiver lines all around the world, some 800 or so receivers across all the coasts of Canada, including in the Great Lakes. Those get managed by our field team and with the support of our partners. Um, researchers can leverage and rely on these when they're designing their own studies. Um, we also uh, dig in and innovate <coughs> new ways of attaching listening equipment to mobile platforms like the Slocum and Wave Glider that you heard about, and more recently to things like live buoys and ocean physics drifters, where we're happy to be uh, the first people through the door trying to figure out where all the, uh, the issues are with these new pieces of gear before people have to go and rely on them operationally. Um, so we heard from Mike at the ROV shop this morning. Uh, his gear is great, of course, for habitat characterization, mooring recovery, active tracking, visual surveying, you name it. He's got a pretty full dance card, but he's happy to go somewhere warm, he said, so hopefully you've got some good ideas on how to use him. Um, but as a data shop, we're infrastructure too. Um, infrastructure to us means being able to aggregate the data that's reported into OTN from individual projects, labs, institutes, citizen science initiatives, uh, using any or all of these technologies, uh, giving people the right idea of how those studies were conducted and what the, what the drawbacks are. As we heard this morning from Nathan, it's important to understand why the decisions were made uh, for certain studies. Uh, and reporting that data to the researchers who deployed the tags that get picked up incidentally on these, on these secondary neighbor equipment. So those researchers can then take that network-wide detection extract file that we build for them here at OTN 
and use them as input into uh, community-built open source telemetry analysis software like GLATOS, uh, which we're happy to uh, pitch in on uh, building out, as well as uh, we're starting to get into bridging other popular telemetry analysis tools like VTrack, and we're also responsible for, uh, if any of you folks are into Python instead of R, which I've yet to meet uh, a true <laughs> a true Pythonista among this crowd, but I assure you we exist. There are dozens of us. Um, we maintain uh, a, sacri uh, a mirror, if you will, of GLaDOS called Resonate, and you'll be able to use that if you're on the Python side of things, if you find yourself there. If you're talking to Dave Barclay a lot, you may find yourself in Python sooner than you realize. And so, uh, you know, Naomi and Caitlin and Cass put this slide up, but when I look at this graphic as a data guy, uh, the most interesting thing about it is that two out of the three pieces of information that fix any animal detection in space and time are coming from the humans recording it. And often by hand, although we did see an excellent uh, glimpse of the future, I think, uh, where your smartphone is finally going to pick you up when it comes to writing down dates, times, and locations. I'm super excited for that. Um, so you've got receiver deployment history, which gives us the location for a detected tag. You've got tagging activity, giving us the animal that was carrying that tag. And then you've got the instrument itself recording the times and the tag codes, matching those two bits of information together to give us this animal at this time in this place. So for people looking to aggregate and cross-reference and share this data, people that I hire, uh, the human-derived components of the information being shared around have to be beyond question. So to the data shop here at OTN, that means standardizing input formats. That means putting things through a set of quality control tests to help us catch any small errors or large errors before it gets to a point where another researcher is going to have to rely on it. So for example, we've refined and fixed up our format for our deployment sheets. Uh, this is, we call this the short form, the long form. I'm not sure any independent researcher has ever seen the long form. It was a hilarious piece of uh, documentation that we had to maintain uh, at OTN proper, and our field team was very thankful when we finally killed it. Um, this is basically ensuring that people out in the field can record the information on their receiver deployments and recoveries in a way that will be useful and easily understood by anybody else who needs to use them. So, you know, here are the deployment details, and here's the recovery information. And it might seem trivial, it might seem obvious, to give folks sheets to fill out specifically, that's say location and date time and serial number for the instruments and who was it that did each part of it and what data files came out and who was it deploying, who was it recovering, who was on the boat that day. Um, but without any guidelines in place, if you're on the deck of a boat after a long day, if you're going completely freehand or half freehand, if you were like Nathan and you've printed out uh, things ahead of time to bring with you and you have the wish list of where you want to put your receivers but you don't necessarily know how it's going to go, you might actually end up with something like this. Or, if you're working completely freehand, you might actually end up with something like this. Which are, at the very least, a nightmare for you as an individual researcher the next day when you're trying to digitize this stuff. It's a transposing accident waiting to happen, and it's not fit to head into my data system and go out to another researcher in a pleasant digital format that doesn't tell you all of the input, uh, interesting things that happen ahead of time. Um, so who is it that does this work at the OTN Data Center? In terms of our background and our expertise, we've got a mix of biologists and computer scientists and data management professionals. We're doing the work of receiving and aggregating all this data that is generated by a bunch of very differently designed and executed projects that come into us from all around the world. Um, we run them through quality control procedures to make sure they're accurate and fit to be used as source data for information that gets shared with you guys. And we make the final pictures of the projects uh, the activity on, in the data system. We build reports and detection extracts for you guys to take back and analyze. Uh, we give you the full accounting of everywhere your animals have gone across all of the compatible listening stations across the OTN database ecosystem. Um, we have adapted and extended the OTN data system constantly to accommodate new technologies and animal tracking uh, and making sure that we can hold tomorrow's data and have it in the proper context with all the data that we are already holding. Um, we also design and curate a mapping for this sort of data to go and live in larger databases of animal presence like the Ocean Biogeographic Information System and the Global Biodiversity Information System, which we'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of people power, the big fun thing I like to see on this graph is that we are the biggest single department at OTN um, because our partnerships on the data level have grown exponentially over the first decade of our existence, and now we are supporting other communities independent of our own uh, that want to do data the OTN way. So to support these folks that report to us and our partners, we have a few distinct teams within the data center. We have data acquisition coordinators like Naomi and Caitlin that you met this morning who are focused on collecting and verifying incoming data. 
We have software development team that builds and refines the tools that we use to put the metadata and data together and make data products out of it. Ryan, who you might have met this morning, was a member of the, of the programming team. And we have a database unit that handles updates to the form of the database itself and designs new data products and outputs. Um, we actually have a new position open within our database unit that was posted recently. So if you're a database geek uh, or know somebody who is, please do check that out on our website. We're hoping to get even bigger. But even as we do continue to grow, uh, nine people can't run the whole world of acoustic telemetry research. Uh, so there are independent communities, like I said, out there who have their own resources and some autonomy, and they still want to do things the OTN way when it comes to data. So that means the way that we do things at OTN has to be well documented, standardized, and published in order to make it repeatable by these independent people who are managing regional nodes, data systems. Uh, that brings me to my weirdest diagram. So uh, <laughs> this is how data and metadata about your projects get taken in and moved through the OTN data system. Uh, and through the quality control processes we use here to ensure that verified and accurate data gets uh, used to make global summaries of animal movement or that things that we send out to all of our researchers. So I'm actually not going to delve in too deeply. You're welcome. But there are a few sections that I think it's worth saying some things about. So there's this box on the left, which is where all the source data is coming into us from you guys, the researchers, uh, into our document management system. The software we use at OTN to do that is called Plone. Uh, it's what runs the website at members.oceantrack.org, if you've ever been there. That's Plone. Um, the thing that we love about Plone, it does a very good job of keeping permission folders for each research group. And then the features that we need from it are these abilities to set these really granular permissions and change them, and also to have good version control across all of these input files, uh, and to store them where both researchers that are doing the submitting and the OTN data staff that are doing the processing can see them. So when we take in your data via email, the first thing we do is drop the submitted files into the appropriate Plone folder locations because we know, we know that we have our processes that will pick us up from there. These are things that you may not have to think about as an individual researcher submitting to us, but we will know every separate version of everything you've ever told us about every deployment you ever submit to us, and we can refer back to that and make sure that we can find problems that might pop up later on and help you through them. Um, past that, there are these lovely red circles at various points in the data pipeline. These represent the stages at which we do a bit of quality control on the data and metadata that's been submitted. Uh, we do this to catch any errors in submission at a point before the time that other researchers could conceivably begin to use that data. And this happens in phases. First, we check to see if there's anything inconsistent on the sheet that's been submitted by you this time. So that's the first one down at the bottom there, preload. Once it uh, goes in and passes that, it heads into your project schema where we can check it against everything you've ever told us about your project in the past. Uh, if that matches up with reality, if you haven't deployed a receiver in two places at once, if you haven't put a tag in two fish, we can move on to the database-wide uh, quality control checks that make sure that you and everybody else who's been talking to us have not violated the laws of physics and reality in terms of how your instruments and your equipment has been moving into the field. So the data that makes it through this process gets aggregated with all these other finalized data into a common view that we can run queries against. And it's from there that we summarize and build our reports that we give back to you, but also that we push into public data portals and discovery mechanisms to help people understand that you're out there doing this work. Um, so you'll see these data portals are things like AirDAP and GeoServer. And it's also this point at which we can start to build the summaries that these broader databases of animal presence, like OBIS, uh, will expect to see from us. <coughs> So one thing I've learned over my five years of winding my way through that previous graph is that um, when you're building a global database of biologued animal movement, it's actually more true that you folks are very susceptible to Tobler's first law of geography. And what that means to me is that you guys care much more about what's happening in your region, among your local community, than you do about what's happening all around the world, depending on your study species. That's not always true for the shark folks. But uh, generally speaking, you care more about what's happening in the next bay than what's happening halfway around the world. Um, you guys also tend to share views on what should happen to your data uh, between you and your nearest neighbors. You guys have similar opinions on uh, whether how, how to safeguard intellectual property, what kind of embargoes are appropriate, um, how best to work together to collaboratively deploy your listening stations. You guys aggregate very well at the local scale, and we want to embrace and support that, uh, that tendency. So both on a policy level and with technology, uh, keeping this regional data management regime empowered and in control of their constituency's data uh, wherever it's possible is a benefit to OTN, both in not having to take on too much at once 
and in properly leveraging um, the communities that people build organically and empowering them to do the work. So that is why we design our database so it's easy to maintain your own copy of the core data system. And then we've called the communities that have adopted these databases so far uh, OTN nodes. So we share all of our structure and our code that builds out uh, the quality control processes with all of our partner nodes. And the groups that perform this role for their communities around the world can do it exactly the way we do it here at OTNDC. So they're structurally identical to the database in OTN's core data center. We use that fact to leverage and seamlessly share and cross-reference between nodes and uh, across metadata formats where available. Uh, we started doing this in late 2016. We train regional node managers periodically. We keep everybody up to date on the latest tools and techniques that we're, that we're building here at OTNDC. We do those about once a year. Uh, and from a perspective of an individual PI, this is a much nicer arrangement than direct sharing with all your neighbors via email or managing memberships across multiple networks that you think your animals might find their way into. Uh, you report your data regionally to your closest collaborators. The software takes care of ensuring that you benefit from the global network and that the single authoritative repository of your data is maintained in the place where you are most likely to care about it, update it, and curate it yourself. So the regional node is king. The global network takes care of the cross-referencing, but the authoritative copy of your project stays with your community. So around the database itself, the database node diagram is exactly the same as the OTN diagram. If you're paying attention, that shouldn't be a surprise to you. Um, so we adapt technologies you're already using to implement things like document management and sharing and uh, things like uh, discovery websites that you build off of it. So really the core database is all you get. If you're using Dropbox to share files among your community, you won't pick up clone. You'll use Dropbox. That's fine. That all works very well. Uh, nodes can generate detection extract for their memberships just like we do. And they gain the capacity to push data up to their own data sharing portals, just like we can. So they learn how to push things to OBIS on their own. Uh, we don't have to do it for them. So they have the capacity to do that for themselves. So that's the game. Um, by sharing that common set of processes that we all run to quality control data as it comes in from you guys and having the exact same format in the OTN database as in each of these nodes, we achieve this intercompatibility. Um, the common processes give us confidence in making comparisons across the nodes. Uh, and matching across distinct data systems. And the output formats are standard, meaning they get to be compatible with the analysis packages that we're going to talk about later in the week. Um, that helps us share those tools as well among all of these disparate regional communities. And the other nice thing about having so many collaborators in other parts of the world that are using this system is that they teach us. They come up with new use cases, new configurations, uh, problems and technologies that we have to then become fluent in. And by training and connecting all these other database managers, we get this insight into the needs of new communities and the opportunity to collaboratively tackle new problems and challenges, which makes the overhead of open development and rigorous change management that we take on at OTNDC worth it to us. Uh, we're in the know sooner about these new ideas and we get to share the results with folks from around the world. So this is my other crazy diagram that shows you how complicated my own life has become. Uh, we have lots of active nodes now, the Acoustic Tracking Array platform in South Africa who are very active in the chat. Um, our Northeast Pacific node, centered in British Columbia, uh, OTN Brazil, the FACT network, which is centered in Florida, but stretches from uh, the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to the Chesapeake. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Telemetry Observing System, which covers a lot of the same area, but has a, a, a distinct membership. And I know Kim Ritchie, the data manager for Ma ACT Matos, is in the chat as well. Hi, Kim. Uh, the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observing System, of which uh, a lot of you guys in the room are actually alumni. And more recently, Migramar, who are based in Ecuador, but they reach from Peru all the way through to California. Uh, there's also a few long-standing data partners over on the right. They don't necessarily use the OTN data system, but they still want to be intercompatible with the ecosystem that we are growing out. Uh, the two notable ones that we've made a lot of efforts with in the last year or so are the European Tracking Network and IMOS's Animal Tracking Facility. Uh, we've had a great working relationship with them. For whatever reason, they have to run something else under the hood. And uh, we're here to meet them wherever we can to, to still get ourselves together and intercompatible. And we've also recently, as Amy spilled the beans on, as it is her beans to spill, uh, we've been asked to assist them in designing that report out from Fathom Live that will be able to be adjusted not just by OTN, but eventually because of the formatting uh, consistency into any of the OTN database nodes. So their proof of concept is completed. I like where it's at a lot. Uh, they can deliver your project data into OTN's document management system for you on your behalf. And so it is a little bit of extra work. I want to just 
separately throw out that these data partnerships that we make um, that are people who can't pick up nodes, it is a little bit of extra work on our part to do it, but we do want to make sure that we're connecting every community as we find them and meeting them as best way we can. I will mention especially that um, the technical level of intercompatibility is not always the hardest part. The hardest part is usually the policy level. So you're looking at people who've made very disparate agreements on who owns what piece of the data, what people's reporting requirements are to one another, uh, what publication requirements are. Across the OTN nodes, there's a level of consistency about tag owners being, uh, having primacy, having the, the ownership of their detections. That seems to be a common theme that runs through all of the intercompatible data systems that I work with. Uh, when people get other ideas, there are policy hurdles for us to jump through, but if we're not 100% compatible with a certain network, it could very be, well be that the, the bottleneck is not technical, the bottleneck is a matter of policy. And so I want to just sort of throw that in here and say that also it could be a matter of time. It could be the fact that there are so many things for my data shop to get up to that we haven't quite made our way there yet. So we're doing our best. And these are the results so far because every presentation needs a map. This is mine. Um, here you can see the reach of all of the networks that we've interconnected across both the nodes and the partners that we've built crosswalks to so far. Um, so the OTN Global Aggregator node is that nice light blue. Um, and in our in-house managed Northeast Pacific node is the teal. Uh, we've got many of our 61,000 tags that are going to leave embargo over the next few years. Uh, and tags by manufacturers that we haven't had to occasion to deal with yet, we're building capacity to handle in the OTN data systems. Um, we're up to 70 different tag models across a dozen or so manufacturers so far. That's pop-off tags, pit tags, acoustics, satellite, light level geolocation. Uh, you name it. We are obviously an acoustic shop first. This is, uh, acoustics is the place where there's this natural uh, desire to aggregate and share and cross-reference, and there's this obvious win when you do. Uh, so there is, we're very acoustic heavy, but uh, on a logistical level, we want to be able to, to handle any sort of tagging effort, any sort of machine-derived animal presence data. We would love for an OTN database to be able to handle that sensibly and deliver it to the places it needs to go. Uh, and so my own focus in 2019 that looks to be continuing into 2020 is the design of this archival data format that will give the proper context of any of these projects uh, using the OBIS ENV data Darwin core event core format to report project data upstream into OBIS and GBIF. Um, so I presented an iteration of that at a biodiversity standards conference last year. It went over pretty well. We're looking to incorporate some of the feedback we got there into a version that will become OTN's official way of packaging up a data product to OBIS. So the start of all this began in 2018, bringing together as many of the big biologging actors as possible. Now here in this lovely picture, if you've ever been to Ustend, you can either go there no times or 10 times, I think. No one's ever been there once. Um, but <coughs> this is where the IOD project office is. This is where OBIS's headquarters are. This is where, if you've ever used the world, uh, Ocean, uh, what is it, the World Taxonomic Database of Marine Species is based there, worms. So a lot of uh, a very big global scale marine data, data systems are there and we tend to leverage them uh, to do various parts of our job. So we're very thankful for the folks that we meet out in Ostend. Um, we also see in this diagram partners from um, Australia and Europe, both uh, ETN and IMOS Animal Tracking are there. Our node partners from South Africa and the USA are here helping us agree upon a standard to express this data in, Darwin, in a Darwin Core format that will describe all these relevant aspects of the biologging effort and the accuracy of those results. Um, this standard is meant to reach across all the different technologies like I was talking about, RFID, camera traps, light level geolocation, satellite. The, the key is machine assisted information about animal presence. And so I'm thankful for the leadership specifically in this group of OBIS USA's Abby Benson and the Atlas of Living Australia's Peggy Newman who are guiding the uh, machine observations interest group uh, as we help uh, dig into a lot of the examples that we're building out here that we hope people will follow. So that is the current project. We collect example projects of all these different logging types. Uh, we provide Darwin Core mappings on a GitHub project page to serve as a guideline for practitioners and networks to move their data from these projects into a format that can be ingested by OBIS and GBIF. If any of that sounded interesting to you, Congratulations on being as weird as I am, and please follow this link at the bottom of the page and join us as we try to, uh, to make a good effort uh, to express this data to these broader data systems. Uh, so if you want to see an example of what that looks like really quickly, 
This is a Blue Shark data set with acoustic sensor tags on them. Uh, other, other examples that you'll find on the page, Sarah Davidson did something with marsupials down in Australia. Uh, Peter Desmet of INBO submitted a seabird satellite tag example. Uh, Anton Vandepoot and Maxime Sweetlove adapted a cleaned up penguin data set that was part of the retrospective analysis of Antarctic tracking data, which was really great. That's, that's an enormous data set that covers a lot of different taxa. Um, my example you'll find next to Sarah's on the wiki. This is the kind of stuff that we would create events for. Uh, animal captures, attachments of tags, platform deployments, receiver deployments. Uh, for animal occurrences, we do things like captures, detections, and recaptures if you guys are filling out that part of the form or that separate form that I give out, uh, telling me when you recapture one of your animals. That helps me a lot because that can feed, that information feeds all the way, all the way back into here. It doesn't just shut off your tag in the OTN data system. It also helps me make a better picture for these broader data systems when they come out. And so once we do all this mapping, uh, we can be sure that OBIS and GBIF will understand the details of our project, the nature of the animal presence we're reporting to them. And if we can do this for enough different archetypes of animal tracking, we have a set of guidelines that people can adapt and follow to bring their data into the, into the picture. Um, this is just a URL where you can grab my example if you're interested in digging in, in on it. If you're familiar with Darwin Core Archives and you want to play with my work, that's where you'll find it. I would suggest, though, this is the, this is the place to engage the, uh, the GitHub project before. So hopefully we'll uh, get one or two heads in there that will tell us how to properly do this stuff. So, oh, there it is again. I'm smarter than myself. Um, so the software maintained at OTNDC to keep ourselves doing the data curation work in a uniform way and sharing what we learned to our node partners include this data management software package, which we've uncreatively named IPython Utilities, uh, the analysis and visualization features of packages like GLATOS and the Pythonic twin Resonate, uh, and the scripts that I use to knock data sets into OBIS ENV format. Uh, another thing that we've recently moved into, we've been trained by the folks from Software and Data Carpentries uh, in the right way to build curriculums for software and data-oriented workshops with the help of starter curriculums that have been given out to us by uh, traditional workshop leaders, people with a lot of experience, uh, like Jake Brownscomb, who's sitting in the back, and Chris Holbrook, who is the core maintainer of GLaDOS. These guys have given us the starter curriculums that we generalize and we provide online to let people pick up and not only learn on their own time, but also adapt and teach to their local communities, to the people who are nearby to them. So check us out on GitHub. Uh, we do have a couple of our workshops up there right now. Uh, the one that, that Jake has pulled together, has helped us pull together now is uh, quite broad ranging and hopefully very useful generally to get up to speed on data visualization and analysis using R. Uh, so please do come visit us on our GitHub page and uh, check that out. So that's it. Um, OTN's data shop, the thing I want you to take away is that uh, our data shop is here to assist you in quality controlling your data and metadata. We're here to give you a summary of all your animal detections across all the networks that we are compatible with in a standard format. We make sure your data is part of a broader database of animal presence, if that's a thing that you're looking to do. And we help you develop software packages that will help you more easily aggregate, summarize, analyze, and visualize your results. So that is the story. Thanks for your time. How are we on questions? So the question is, do we have any plans to incorporate side scan or um, variables about the environment and into the metadata for OTN? Uh, and while we don't want to be in the business of telling other people how that data should be formatted, there are, especially for side scan and other oceanographic variables, very uh, well, well healed examples of how to properly express that data. In the OBIS ENV format, there is an opportunity to link out to separate data sets that are complementary to the data sets that uh, describe the animal presence. And so what I think I would do there is make sure that the data is properly registered with one of the oceanographic or appropriate, if you're doing, say, you know, GenBank stuff, we could talk about things that went into GenBank. I'd say that we would refer out to the supplementary data sets that are better held by people who are not, you know, we, we're not looking to be an expert in all things. We want to be able to refer to other expertise when we can. So that's how I would handle that. And that's what I would look to do. <laughs>